everybody. Welcome to another episode of Theater Tuesdays. And this is a show where I like to gather my theater friends and we talk all about all things musicals, uh, straight plays, theater, everything. It's so much fun. And I'm theater critic Grace Wagner. Today I have with me fellow theater critics and teacher uh, Scott Savage is here. And I thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, I am super happy to be invited and uh, great. Like being considered a colleague of yours is uh, it's a huge thing for me. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you, you just got admitted into the ACTA, into the uh, Theater Critics Association. So that's very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll be honest, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that how long this was something that I thought about until I started doing it and then went, wow, this is great. Why haven't I been doing this forever? This, I don't know, kind of a blend yeah. of all of the things that I like about theater. So. It's not for everybody being a critic. It, it It's, you are kind of, you, people think you're sort of the bad guy sometimes. Uh, sometimes but, I am. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you are. <laughs> But it, there is something really satisfying about promoting the arts, but also analyzing, critiquing, uh, and uh, hopefully, I, I what what it gives me the most joy is finding those hidden gems, and getting to celebrate them, and hopefully giving them a platform. That's my favorite. People don't know about and be like, oh, go check this out. This is amazing, and then they do, and they have a great experience, or the people are like, oh, someone's talking about us. This is so exciting. I love. Oh that. yeah. Yeah, I love being able to come back and go, oh. Like, okay, I'm seeing a show for a college class and I'm going to go write a, you know, one page paper about this and who's going to bother reading this because I'm just me, right? Yeah. And and then I, I come back to this and I feel like, wow, when people read it and then when it impacts, you know, someone comes back and says, hey, I have the same exact experience with this. I'm so glad you wrote this. Mm -hmm. You know, I... Uh, or or I saw this show because you brought it up. And and even when people don't agree, I like being able to come back and have some of those same experiences, you know, those shared experiences that really that's what live theater is about. Yeah. And I don't always get to see shows with my friends, but I like when mm -hmm. we both see a show and then we can both talk about it. Yeah, it's been fun. I mean, we've had a couple shows that we have, that you have reviewed that uh, I've seen or I've reviewed that you've seen. And it's been kind of fun to talk about and be like, oh, you know, so what do you think about it? What was your perspective? And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's really, it's, it's part of what I missed so much during the pandemic is that communal experience of theater and the arts just in general. Yeah. And I think that I think that the further we get from that, the more that people are seeing, hey, this is, I forgot that this is a part of my life. And, and mm -hmm. I think that we're going to see more of a rebound with that. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, since it's your first time coming on the show, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got started in your love of theater and uh, musical theater and, and the arts. Yeah. Uh, so my theater started in middle school. I took a set of electives where I did choir and uh, I think I did theater, but I, I remember doing an art class and I did something else and none of those really stuck with me. And I was registering for my middle school theater classes and went to my dad and said, what do I take? And he goes, oh, you should take a theater class. That's fun. Um, I met a lot of cute girls in theater in, in high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I was a weird seventh grade child and didn't have a lot of friends. And I went, okay, yeah, I mean, that, that yeah. sounds fine. And then I would consistently find when I was registering for classes, I just was always putting theater down as what I wanted to take. And I, I kept wanting to do it. Um, in, in seventh grade, I was uh, a mattress night in Once Upon a Mattress at Spanish Fork Middle School. Um, and there was a moment where we did you know, the pulling all the armor and swords and everything out of the, the bed at the end. And I I had a bag of Skittles in my pocket and I pulled out a green Skittle and held it up like it was a pea. And I did this in a dress rehearsal, un, un, uh, unprovoked or un, per, given permission by my teacher and director. And she loved it and she thought it was funny. And for years after that, uh, Kara Polson, who was my teacher, would tell her students about you know this moment where a student had done that. And I was just like, great, I'm glad that worked. <laughs> um, yeah. And then in, in so I, I did two years of middle school, two years of junior high, all in Spanish Fork. Mm -hmm. And um, when this happened, so then I moved on to junior high 
And I did a scene from Two Gentlemen of Verona with my junior high teacher, Chris Holly. And she was phenomenal. And we took second place. And this was the first time I performed in front of people in a part that I felt like I con contributed to significantly. And I learned to love Shakespeare. I love to analyze the language and read it and and pick it apart. And uh, then I I decided after graduating high school and and going on a mission, uh, an LDS mission, I wanted to be a teacher. And mm -hmm. then I studied theater. And that was great for me um, mm -hmm. because it blended teaching and something that I liked. And those pieces just kind of came together. Mm -hmm. uh, I went on to grad school and did an MFA program at the University of Central Florida, focused in theater for young audiences and directing, mm -hmm. and got the opportunity to work with a, a private or like a, a nonprofit children's theater and fell in love with specifically youth made for or theater made for youth. Yeah. Um, and, and I could talk about that all day. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so uh, what what was your initial draw? You said you fell in love with Shakespeare as a high school student. What was the initial appeal? Because so many people might think, oh, teens are never going to be interested in that. It's too, um, too, too I don't know if it's that I was in high school in the early 2000s when punk rock and emo phase was a big deal. Mm -hmm. But I love tragedy. Um, uh -huh. Shakespeare has such complicated characters who find themselves in sub such complicated situations even mm -hmm. even in some of his comedies you know you look at much ado about nothing or two gentlemen in rona that have these very very challenging or, or taming of the shrew challenging narratives uh -huh. that still have you know happy endings but you have to ask some hard questions to get there and i liked that i liked something that challenged me to think about how does this story work and what is it about these characters that work and the language is mm -hmm. just beautiful right yeah. you, you can't once you un once you can begin to unpack the language, uh, which which is less difficult than I think people sometimes give it credit for. You see how it's spoken out loud and how it's intended to be spoken out loud, and it just becomes mm -hmm. a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, I can see that. Uh, one of the first experiences I had with theater was actually my dad taking me to the Utah Shakespeare Festival when I was like eight or nine. Mm -hmm. And I really, when I was little, I really valued anything that made me feel like a grown up. I wanted to be treated. Uh, I didn't like to be treated like a child. And, and, uh, and so anything that was I saw as kind of grown up or mature or uh, that was what I wanted to be a part of. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And so like going to see Fantasia, I vividly remember that that was like a big deal because I was like a grown up grown up movie. yeah <laughs> and I was yeah. excited because I always loved animation and I always loved and so getting to go to the Shakespeare Festival that was a big deal and I, I remember we saw Twelfth Night I remember really enjoying that and I remember we saw um Blythe Spirit which is random but oh that is random um, but yeah. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I enjoyed it I enjoyed it very much and uh and so, and I think we saw Merchant of Venice, I think too. I'm okay. pretty sure that we went a couple of years, so it all kind of blends, but, but yeah. And then uh, I saw when I was in fourth grade, I took dance classes and I'm like the world's worst dancer, but <laughs> I, I took, I took classes anyway. And um, my teacher was anybody's in West Side Story. Oh, wow. So that was an early, an early uh, show that I remember seeing. Um, and then my grandma got me the best of Andrew Lloyd Webber for my birthday when I was like nine yeah. and, uh, and a, a cassette tape. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think uh, what's fun about that is that there are, even as an adult, there are shows yeah. where I'm like, I am, I've been doing theater for decades now. And there mm -hmm. are shows where I'm like, I really should know this. And the, <laughs> the canon of theater is so broad yeah. that sometimes you just miss it you know and, true. and sometimes you come back and go oh my gosh how do I not yeah. how do I not know this play I don't know well it's true I mean I was thinking about the other day like something like Man of La Mancha I've never seen it oh you know, there's yeah there's some of these like classic standard you know musicals that aren't done that much and so I've never seen it yeah I my uh my wife took me to see Man of La Mancha at Hale in Orem probably five or ten years ago and mm -hmm. oh man uh I have I have rarely been in a room where I felt so much tension as, mm. as when they assault her. Um, right. And singing the songbird song. And I just went, and, and nothing, 
they didn't touch her. There was no contact. It was just the lights dimming and then closing it. And it was just, oh, um, yeah. man, heavy stuff. One of these days, I'll get to see it uh, one of these days. But uh, but yeah, did you have shows that you remember seeing as uh, at a young age that like with your with your family? Yeah, yeah. Um, I so my dad took us. Well, we would listen to Phantom and Les Mis all the time in the car. Mm-hmm. So like mm-hmm. we'd go on road trips, and my dad. I remember my dad playing it and then stopping in the middle of songs and like explaining the context of what it meant, which is something I do as a teacher too. Um. And it's kind of fun to be able to go, oh, this is exactly the same experience I had. Um, but I also saw uh, Donny Osmond perform as Joseph on the national tour of Joseph in Chicago when I was about six. And I remember very little of the show other than sitting very high in a balcony and being terrified the whole time because I thought I was going to fall. Like it was a very, very steep balcony. Um, <laughs> but I remember also watching the the DVD of it or the VHS of it all the time uh, and listening to it and you know learning the mega mix and and seeing like oh there are children my age in this show how does that happen um and because that's basically a pro shot that that joseph yeah 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 Yeah. (laughs) and just looking at it and going okay uh this is really really neat so i think Mm that those three are are probably some of the ones i remember the most um i remember being very excited about going with my wife and my parents to go see Wicked uh, at the Capitol mm-hmm. Theater, probably, probably 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and other than that, honestly, I didn't see a ton of theater in my youth. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw a couple things. I saw Pippin at the Shakespeare Festival um, and Hamlet at the Shakespeare Festival. But I remember wanting to do Shakespeare or do theater in part because I wanted excuses to go and see plays. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. we we did a lot of Disney trips and a lot of camping growing up and my parents love theater and they, you know, they're actually right now seeing Harry Potter and the Cursed Child um, oh, really? in New York. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so, and they're going to see Sweeney Todd with Josh Groban tomorrow. So like, <laughs> it's not that we didn't love it. It just wasn't something that always came up. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think as an adult, I've gotten to see a lot more theater and mm-hmm. pursued it more aggressively. Well, I mean, there's just so much here in Utah. And I yeah. honestly think that some of these productions are every bit as good as the things I've seen in New York. The The big difference that in New York is obviously they have more money for productions, but also uh, in New York, they just have newer stuff. But I put up some of what I've seen at Center Point, you know, and, and some of these other, you know, quality, really quality non-equity theaters. I put it up against anything that I've seen practically. Uh, I saw in the Music Man at Center Point, and it was better than Hugh Jackman. Uh, <laughs> there, That's there, fair. Music Man. <laughs> uh, people can fight me, but it's true. It's true. No, it was I believe you. Outstanding. I think he has great stage presence, and I think, like we learned in the movie version of Les Mis, that his singing is fine. <laughs> <laughs> he, he just I just felt like he was shouting the songs a little bit which uh, I mean it was fine I didn't dislike yeah. it I'm just saying this one in center point was outstanding and uh so you can find just really 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 great productions here in Utah we are uh, just you could literally see something every single night if you wanted to oh yeah, yeah. well and our venues are really good too I mean mm-hmm. even yeah. even speaking of like New York quality stuff I saw the world premiere of Shucked I won tickets to it yeah um, and and that is on Broadway and it's a Tony Award nominee. Yeah. And it was the well, same. Well, I mean, that path. is equity. So yeah, and, and that's true. But I also like, I've seen things at the Parker that have been yeah. phenomenal to me. Unbelievable. The best Hamlet that I've ever seen was there last yeah. year. Um, mm-hmm. I have seen things, you know, at both of the Hales that are very solid and mm-hmm. and the spectacle of Tuacon is, yeah. you know. Their, their Christmas Carol at Parker was outstanding. I mean, I've seen Christmas Carol countless times i've seen it i reviewed it yeah. four times last year alone i've yeah. seen it so many times so to really stand out i liked it so much that i went a second time with my parents yeah well and it's kind of an open secret times. that byu or not byu but utah dancers are uh are world yeah. renowned oh, yeah. right That's i mean true. We, when we, we lived in Florida, the number of people that would be dancers in the phantasmic show or in the disney parades or things mm-hmm. like that that came out of the U program or BYU or UVU yeah. 
was That's I mean true, they were true. we're talking like 60 70 percent of them yeah you know it well and lot. and dancing with the stars and uh so you think you can dance is like huge they were it's huge Utah the pros oh yeah. yeah 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 it's true um so do you think that there are particular productions that are especially effective because you work in elementary school right right uh I work in a middle school so I oh, teach sixth school, through eight okay. Yeah. Do you think that there are particular productions? Like, I mean, obviously people think of, you know, Matilda and Annie and, you know, things like that, but uh, that are especially good for getting kids excited about theater. Um, I actually want to go back to your point with that, where you said, I like things that make me feel like a grown up. Mm -hmm. um, I teach at a school where we're like 95% free and reduced lunch. I have more refugee students than white students. 30 mm -hmm. different languages are spoken in the homes of my students. So we're, we are diverse and we're not just yeah, diverse yeah. for Utah. We're like a very, very diverse school. And I took my kids last year to see Medea at the Greek festival that Westminster does. Mm -hmm. They loved it. They ate it up. Um, I took them to see uh, the Christmas story and uh, Elf at Pioneer Theater Company. Um, and there's one other that we saw, uh, Ain't Misbehaving. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that, but there is still a lot of value in the show itself mm -hmm. being being something where they went, oh, this is what it looks like to see things on a stage. Yeah. Um, I think there is something yeah. to the cultural capital that, you know, drawing from, from titles that, that they already know. My kids get excited about the thought of going and seeing Adam's Family or Beauty and the Beast or Cinderella. Mm -hmm. uh, but they also push back on doing anything. Like when I talk to them about season selection and kind of lay out, here are some of the options that we're thinking about. They don't like the thought of doing something that makes them feel childish. None mm -hmm. of them want to do- That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. None of them wanted to do Willy Wonka because they didn't want to be Oompa Loompas or the children. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a great story and has strong literature connections and it has great music and it's fun and colorful and bright, they push back on it. Um and and I, I think that that's fair. Are you a fan of Rachel's reviews? Do you look forward to Family Movie Night, Female Film Critics Panels, or the Talking Disney podcast? If so, please consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron. As a patron, you get to access monthly events such as the watch alongs and Q&As, where you get to talk to stars and find out the behind the scenes of the movie making industry. And you can pick what I review for a family movie night or even become a guest on the podcast. Podcasts and YouTube channels are expensive and I really, really could use your help. I would so appreciate it. You also get to be a member of the Facebook group where we talk about all the films that we're seeing and we have so much fun. Go to patreon.com slash hallmarkies and select one of the Rachel's fan tiers. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. And sometimes they connect really well when I'll show them like the the music video of In the Heights from the 96,000 song, or if I show them Tony Award samples of Hades Town or things like that. So I think that honestly, kids have a really good barometer for things that are good. And as long as, as long as it's good theater, then it's good theater. Mm -hmm. And then the other side of that coin is with TYA specifically, there are things that make good TYA versus bad TYA. And good TYA follows the same principles of making great theater in that it's engaging and it's specific and it's well, you know, well-directed and, and talented vocals and all those things. Um, but it, it is quippier, I think, even when it's dramatic. Uh, I saw Murder on the Orient Express at Pioneer Theater Company, and my students would love that just for the simple fact that it switches between being very funny and very serious very quickly. Mm -hmm. So, so things that can do that and keep your, your attention going from beginning to end. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think that that's what really gets my students engaged, but they still talk about shows that we've seen two or three years ago. There was a great mm -hmm. production of Charlotte's web that UVU did. And, and again, it was new to them. They had never seen theater in the round before I'd talked to them about it, but UVU came to our stage, put the show up and we had students on all four sides and the actors in the middle and they went mm -hmm. oh this is what you were talking about I said yep it is mm -hmm. so how do you help your students deal with like disappointments not getting a role preparing for a role dealing with auditions all of that kind of thing 
Um, that's literally what I wrote my thesis on. Oh. Uh, casting as a pedagogical practice. So mm-hmm. the biggest thing that I talk to them about is that the ensemble is the most important part of the show. And I'll show them a number like, um, you know, one day more, or do you hear the people sing from Les Mis? And say, I want you to imagine that the only three people on stage right now are Jean Valjean and Javert and Cosette. Mm-hmm. And say, is does this change? Does this impact how you would feel about this moment? And they go, yeah, obviously. I said, right. You may not be able to point out the individuals in this, but, you know, or I'll show them something with really high choreography, like the 96,000 uh, scene from In the Heights and say, would you notice if three or four of the people in each of these shots just had no idea what the choreography was? And they go, yeah. And I go, right. Mm-hmm. Which is why it's so important for you. You matter, right? Mm-hmm. No matter what your part is, you matter. Um, and when I do my my auditions, I let kids tell me what parts they're interested in playing. And I talk to them about it. And I use understudies so that I have more opportunities for more students. Um, I mix it up. I mm-hmm. I try and cast kids in different parts from year to year. One girl who I taught was a really phenomenal young or adult Nala. Um, and then the next year, she could have been a very solid team moon when we did Once on this Island. But I wanted to give her a different part because playing an ingenue twice in a row felt like not stretching her in terms mm-hmm. of what she was capable of. And she did a phenomenal job in the other role, but it took some conversation to go, hey, look, this is not a step down. This is not a this is not going from an A to a B to not mm-hmm. play the lead part here. Yeah. And and so we have a lot of those conversations. Um, I send out personal casting letters and let kids accept or decline their parts. And then I can come back to them later if they say, oh, I don't want to do this part and say, you did accept it. You know, I, I gave you the option and you told me before I announced the cast list what what you're OK with. Um, and so I, I try and do a lot of things where they have a lot of ownership over it. Because mm-hmm. especially at this level of of production, their talent range is mostly dictated by, I mean, a, a super narrow margin. Um, many of them sing fine and a couple of them sing very well. But I would rather have someone who sings fine but is committed to learning and growing in a part. And so I, I cast kids who being in a part is going to stretch them in some way. And, and that's what I ultimately come back to. I love that Uh, because in high school, I had a choir teacher who her main emphasis was on winning, you know, and, and having the best choir that she could have, which I can understand that as a professional, like she's going to want, but to to be good. Um, But she failed spectacularly in nurturing talent. And uh, because that was her sort of focus. And there was a long time where I basically thought I was a bad singer and I knew I was a bad dancer. That is just a true fact. But, <laughs> uh, but being a, uh, uh, but I think I'm a pretty decent singer, but it took me a long time. And I actually took lessons at Hale Orm for a long, long time before I had sort of the confidence to be like, okay, I'm like, you know, the, the greatest singer in the world, but I like, it's pleasant, you know, to listen to yeah. it. It was because uh, she just, she just, failed in her job and so I'm always happy to hear when I hear people working with youth that are actively trying to nurture talent where that's the priority not is our choir slash show going to be the best yeah well and I think that I think that you shoot yourself in the foot a lot with that anyway right if you Mm -hmm. hyper focus on the three or four kids that have the most because it's always the kids who have the most access anyway it's the kids who can afford a private music lesson or a private dance lesson and and have done those things or who have seen the most shows or or who have parents that can sit with them and do that right mm-hmm. and and you're ultimately just saying hey look congratulations you have the best life and now I'm going to reward you for it by letting you perform in front of people right you know and yeah and and how do you know whether you like something or or are good at if you never get a chance to try it Right. And so I do a lot of things where I try and spread out the opportunity amongst my students just so that they can come back and be like, look, I want the opportunity to try this. And if I demonstrate that I'm available, that's that's honestly the number one thing. Anyway, there's a reason that Nicolas Cage is so successful, and it's because he will take any like almost any role that comes up for him. He is <laughs> constantly working. Right. And yeah. and that's really the work of an actor anyway. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of teachers 
in the in kind of the the nice way to say this is that they they have the wrong priorities right mm -hmm. they're they call production priority 1a and the students 1b and that's not the case we're educators we're right you know if you want to go and be a professional and demonstrate that your craft is professional and you want to be the best and compete for tonys or or local you know broadway world awards or things like mm -hmm. that that's great but don't don't take advantage of free labor in a school and use other people's time and children and money to to boost your own ego that's that's not what we're here for yeah. and yeah. and and i will talk about that all the time mm -hmm. as a teacher where i feel like i I am in this because I love to make theater and I think that the work that I do is good. And I think that we are on par with anyone else out there. Um, anyone else coming in and doing the job that I do, I would applaud heartily. Uh, but I still think that at the end of the day, I have those conversations with kids where I say, what are you trying to get out of this? What's your intention? And, mm -hmm. and I'm very transparent with them that they are one of 40 or 60 or a hundred kids that, I'm trying to give meaningful opportunities to, and the goal is always stretch and grow. Right. Um, you know, yeah. even with tech theater kids, or especially with tech theater kids, I had some kids last year who were great at the light board and came in this year and said, I'm going to run lights again. And I said, you're not, because if you do that, you're not going to learn anything. You know, you might get a little bit deeper at this, but I really think you're going to learn more if you're doing hair and makeup or if you're doing mm. sets, mm -hmm. you know? Because mm -hmm. you're in middle school, right? Give yourself the opportunity to take a look at things that you might not otherwise think to do and try it out. And then if you come back and by the time yeah. you're in high school or college, you really do want to zero in on lights or or whatever, that's great. But if I didn't give you that opportunity to at least think about it in middle school and push you to try something new, then I, I failed you as your teacher. And I really just said, great, you learned something well enough that I don't have to do it. And yeah. I, I'm going to use the three kids that know how to do it. That's nurturing talent. That is great. That's great. Uh, so then you started, I don't know how long you've been writing for UTBA. It's been about a couple of years. About a little bit less, about 18 months. 18 months. Um, what, what do you think you have learned since you're so well educated in the world of theater? What have you learned from, uh, from writing, from theater criticism and from writing the reviews? Um, I think the biggest thing is respecting the people and the community and the work that goes into making theater happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember the first time I had to write a negative review, um, and Russell Warren, president of our, of UTBA came back to me and he said, Hey, look, uh, I feel like this review was nice, but inaccurate. He's, he goes, tell me what was good about the show. And I said, honestly, not a lot. And he goes, okay, then you need to say that. And so, and and he used a <laughs> kind of a, a more um, unfriendly title than I had originally submitted, but he was right in saying that. And I said, and ultimately the reason the show didn't work wasn't because people hadn't put in good work. It was because they kind of picked the wrong show for their space. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. it was a, it was the drowsy chaperone and they they had a very, very small, very narrow space and so a lot of the choreography and a lot of the, you know, the effects of the apartment turning around and the airplane were really, really cramped. And it just, for that reason, a lot of the other pieces of it struggled. Mm -hmm. And and I had to take a step back and go, okay, let me understand the craft and the effort that goes into this. Because these are these are often people that I've worked with or that are friends of my friends or that I know or or, you know someone's brother is in a cast and and I have to write something and say, okay. And, and I, I look at it the same way I look at it as a teacher where I go, if I need to say something negative, I'm not going to say, wow, this was dreadful. What I'm going to say is, I think what they needed was more of this. I think what they needed was something more in this direction so that there's something to build off of because no one wants to get a review that says you're not good because, and I also just don't think that it's true. I've never seen a mm -hmm. show where there was no talent in it. I've seen shows right. where there wasn't a lot of effort or where the effort was put in the wrong places, maybe. Well, but... and especially if you're talking about, you know, a volunteer, a group of volunteers, you know, that aren't, uh, that aren't doing this to, you know, be professionals and that, uh, you know, especially you have to kind of take that into account, um, Absolutely. when you're, uh, when you're reviewing and I, 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 
I feel like my reviews always get pinged as being the, the, you know, people get upset about them. And I feel like I'm such a softy. I try so hard to be nice. And, oh and- yeah. I, there have been times where you and I have seen this show and I went, wow, Rachel was way nicer about this. Thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, we just had somebody um, that because of my review where I literally said it was the best they've ever done as a company of all the shows I've seen of them in their review. I had almost no critiques. Like it was such a fluff piece. And they said that they were devastated by it <laughs> and they didn't want UTBA to review them anymore. And I was just like, uh, what? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes I do wonder if like, if maybe part of it is because I seem, maybe I have an effication of being sweet and, and so supportive. And, and, and and so when I come out with maybe a criticism, maybe it it feels more jarring than someone that's, I don't know that they don't see that way. Uh, Yeah. I just come across as really rude all the time. And people are like, wow, (laughs) he was only a little rude this time. (laughs) Maybe I need to have, I need to be tougher or something. I don't know. (laughs) Welcome to the pilot podcast. My name is BJ. And my name is me too. And we promise this promo is worth it. So please don't skip ahead. We're two judgy friends who put our judgmental skills to work for you. We review the pilot episodes of new and popular shows and shows that our listeners request to answer your question, should I watch this? Look, a lot of us are spending a lot more time at home, and yes, we should be reading and trying new projects and enriching ourselves, but does anything beat binging a great show? Let us take the guesswork out of deciding what your next show will be. Tune in to The Pilot Podcast at thepilotpodcast.com. Sorry. Just do your angry eyes when you walk in. Be like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. <laughs> You'd have like a clipboard and be like, yeah, I maybe that's why why Russ tells us to take notes. It's not, it's not a for the for the review, it's for the uh for the people that get scared by it. Oh yeah. Well, I will I'll be honest, uh having my notebook makes me mm-hmm. feel like it is okay for me to think whatever I want because yeah. not everything that I write in my notebook makes it into the show. But things that I write a lot usually Mm -hmm. or into the review, sorry, but things that I write a lot usually do. And it's a great conversation for people around us where, you know, I learn, you know, I I sit next to a lot of season ticket holders. And so I learn what their kind of takes are and what they like and what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. And and I try not to let that influence too much what I'm writing because this is my review and and Mm -hmm. I'm saying what I'm going to say and people can agree or disagree. But I love when I get the chance to hear or see you know, someone having an experience and going, okay, yeah. And and I would say that the vast majority of my reviews are very positive. I would say that yeah. 75% or more of my reviews are just straight glows and gushes, you know, that that there's a lot of stuff where I come back and just go, wow, I'm so impressed because I know this yeah, is my yeah. this is my full-time job. I know the work that it takes to go into this. And and then they pull it off and and they do something great. Um and usually it's you know, when there's something mm-hmm. wrong, it's it's a script that struggles or it's, you know, a, a director's vision that that mm-hmm. just doesn't doesn't fully execute in maybe the way that they had planned or or I don't know, something like well, that. And I've said it before, I do think I am a better movie critic than I am a theater critic, because not that I don't love the experience of going to the cinema, I absolutely do. But uh, I just love the experience of seeing a show and the live energy that even yeah. a bad show, I rarely I can't, I can hardly think of any times when I like walked out being like, I had a terrible time. That was horrible. Um, There's a couple, but but, but not that many, very few. I mean, almost all I'm like, that was, that was, was imperfect, but I still, I still have a good time. Yeah. Well, and there's a reason that the producers is a successful musical because sometimes even a bad show, you walk out and go. Wow. Okay. <laughs> they they sure tried. <laughs> they tried. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but you have a show that people love that you're kind of like, oh, I don't love that show. I think it's like uh, overrated. Overrated. Yeah. Um I'll, I'll give you a couple. Uh mm-hmm. and I won't go too deep on any of them. Okay. Um, but I don't love Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay. Um I think that it gets really overplayed and I think that I have seen that story a lot of different ways and the funniest way I ever saw it was done with puppets and that oh. was really funny. 
Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because there's that line where she says, you puppet you, and all the puppets went. <laughs> I don't like yeah. Midsummer's Night Dream, but I wish it stopped before the the um revelers or whatever the mechanicals, they're called. Yeah, yeah, mechanic. That just feels so long. It that whole really section. Does. It like that section in and of itself is a great like Utah Shakespeare competition piece or mm -hmm. like a a small mm -hmm. act one act like group thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the thing itself is yeah. is rough. But we did. I did see it this year at Shakespeare Festival, mm -hmm. and it was kind of an amazing experience because it not it wasn't just raining. It was like torrential downpour <laughs> raining, and I thought, okay, they're going to stop. You know, they're going to stop it. Yeah. No, they they carried through. It, they must have like waterproof, you know, instruments and stuff. Oh, um, yeah. Because no, we pushed. They pushed on through. Did the entire thing, and the 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 leader of the mechanicals, his name, but he um he broke character a couple times. It's like, how do you feel about the rain and Anyway, so it, that was very memorable, very memorable. But I agree. And I have a hard time also with Midsummer's Night Dream because I always think of uh, Dead Poet Society. Oh, yeah. Uh, and oh. I'm just like, how dare these people's son want to be in a play? I know. <laughs> the worst thing. Oh, my gosh. How dare he? Oh, yeah. And and again, maybe that's just one of those things where it's like, I feel like I have seen it enough times that yeah. I have gotten the catharsis I need out of it. And until something else happens in my life where yeah. I need that, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. As far as musicals, uh, I truly loathe Heathers. Um, oh. okay. I, I don't like the music. I don't like the story. Uh, it was done mm -hmm. by Seattle Children's Theater a couple of years ago. And I, mm -hmm. because I study TYA, I commented on their social media and was like, so why are we doing Heathers at a children's theater? Like, why? Yeah, that's interesting. Why? Yeah. Um, that was pretty R-rated. I've never seen it. Yeah, and there's like a junior version, but it's the same okay. way I feel about schools doing Noises Off or Chicago, where I'm like, yeah, explain to me the pedagogy behind a high schooler running around in their underwear for me. Like, help yeah. me understand what that's teaching just literally anyone, you know? Right. Um, yeah, I agree. And, and that's, I know that sounds prudish, but that doesn't like, and that doesn't preclude other things that are, are racy or, or sketchy being valuable i just think that those in particular i'm like where's mm -hmm. where's the redemption in this like what what right. are we getting you know mm -hmm. where where can i walk away from this and feel like oh yeah um i feel i feel better because yeah. this piece exists it's like in love simon the high school's doing cabaret i'm like uh yeah. that wouldn't be my choice <laughs> yeah i like the show but not for high go, school okay yeah um I also, I'm not a huge fan of Something Rotten. Uh, oh. I, it has grown on me the more I've seen it. Um, mm -hmm. But my first impression of it wasn't great. Mm, um, okay. And it, and it feels like one of those shows that you'd need to really work on to like find the joy in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so maybe that's it for me is that I just yeah. haven't had the opportunity yet to work on it. Um, but, but the first time I saw it, I just went, okay, I guess. Mm, that's interesting since you're a, yeah you're a Shakespeare fan that, yeah that, that's and I love the frogs right like the the musical the frogs is super funny and, and has mm -hmm. some of those same like mocking the the world mm -hmm. of theater kind of jokes yeah um yeah I I think that those are those yeah. are in general kind of where the I oh and Little Shop of Horrors I, uh... I have in my heart for Little Shop of Horrors <laughs> the biggest difference Audrey II, which uh... I just want to build an Audrey 2 at some point for a, <laughs> yeah. a stage crew project mm -hmm. and then be like and this is all the good stuff for me. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest difference that you and I have had is over Puffs. I just yeah. was completely underwhelmed by it. I didn't think it was funny. And maybe it's just that I'm just not that big of a Potter fan. Like I, I, I'm like casual at best. Um, and I just thought the jokes were really obvious and very like what, what they felt like to me were what I call looks like jokes. That yeah. looks like something from the movie. That looks like something from the books, but it's not enough just to have something that looks like what I know. You have to make a joke. You have to make me laugh. And I actually, when I saw it at um, West Valley, I left mm -hmm. it in yeah. remission. I was just like, I'm not enjoying this. And I have a long day. <laughs> I think I that's actually a really good point on Puffs. And I'll say this. I'm a, I'm a ridiculous Potter fan. Like mm. I have four children. Um, my two oldest, we have already read all of the books and my oldest is nine. Mm -hmm. um and i'm going to read them again with my other younger children yeah i have like harry potter banners in my classroom i am like 
deep in the conversation about where JKR fits in the world and, you know, and her yeah. views on a lot of things. I have strong feelings on the reboot. I have strong feelings on Cursed Child. But my my love of Puffs settles on the conclusion of the play. Oh, there's no. the fight, there's the fight sequence that's a little too long. But the ending mm -hmm. of the play basically comes back to the dramatic question of, am I just a secondary character in someone else's story? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I don't know a lot of people that haven't felt that way at some point. Yeah. You know, that's like in um the movie, the holiday. When yes. Kate Winslet, you're being the, you're being the best friend. You should be the lead. Yes. That's what the old man says to Kate Winslet. Exactly. Yep. That yeah. exact thing. <laughs> or Mr. McGregor. I shouldn't have left friend. early. I knew it. But I was just like, <laughs> Well, the good news is I've only done that, that a couple times, but I was just like, "This is just not for me." That's uh, one that you can stream on Broadway HD no, or maybe on I will. Amazon. Maybe I will then. And so, even if you just skip to like the second half of uh, the show, because it is, it is a lot of looks like jokes, and it it totally is a lot of fan service for Harry Potter fans. But mm -hmm. the the resolution, the way it wraps up, uh, really does it for me because mm. it's that second half of the show, just like the second half of the books. Like once I started, once I finished the third Harry Potter book with my kids, you know, they're, they're six and eight at this point. And I said, okay, I just want you to understand someone you like will die in every single one of these books from here forward. And some of my best moments with my kids were sitting on the couch crying about spoiler alert, sorry, <laughs> yeah. um, about Cedric and about Dobby and about Sirius. Sirius. Yeah. And just taking a step back and going like, yeah, there are people that you love that these sad things happen to. And this this is why theater matters, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. This We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable, hardy, or Hallmarkie in your life? What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies merch store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller, Carrie from Hallmark Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. We thought would be fun is we thought for our sort of breakout little segment that we do that it would be fun to, since you love Shakespeare, we would do our top five Shakespeare. Uh, and I admittedly have not seen everything, um, but uh but yeah, I mean, because I had told you that I'm just like not a really a fan of Romeo and Juliet. Like I respect it. It's obviously super important. And but I would way rather see almost any influence of Romeo and Juliet rather than the actual play. I warm bodies. See West, yeah, West Side <laughs> Story, warm bodies. Like, I don't know, just uh, whatever. And yeah. uh, and so, yeah, it's just not my favorite. Um, So I thought it would be fun to talk about uh our top five so what is your number five uh my number five is the comedy of errors it's one of his first plays it's straight ripped out of roman theater with the monochmy mm -hmm. and it's just a fun fast farce that mm -hmm. you can get into and that has a lot of really quotable lines and that is a simple enough plot for how you know it's intended to be convoluted but it's simple enough that you don't have to know shakespeare really well that if mm -hmm. it's a well-directed version of the story uh, you'll see it and just love yeah. it. I think I've seen that before. I remember they, enjoying there's it. There's a really yeah. good one at the Shakespeare Festival, I think three years ago, two years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, well, my number five, I actually have Hamlet at number okay. five. I enjoy it. It's just a little, it just, I start to feel its length a little bit. So that's why it's yes. not number one. <laughs> but I, <clears throat> I mean, it's got some of the most beautiful passages in the history of English language. Uh, mm -hmm. And his inner conflict um, is uh, is you know fascinating to to watch and uh, the other characters and yeah it's so it's I mean what else can you say that hasn't been said yeah. by Hamlet, well so. I showed my middle school students the David Tennant version of the to be done to be or not to be monologue today uh -huh. and 
I asked them, you know, because we were talking about other things, but I said, so what is he feeling? And when my students said, oh my gosh, he wants to die. Yeah. Said, yeah, he does. And he goes, does he? <laughs> he was like, uh, yes. You know, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, I, and I was like, but at but... least not by his own hand. Right, exactly. And that's what we talked about where I came back and went, ultimately, he's struggling with really heavy, difficult things of, I don't, I'm being asked to do something that I don't know that I can do in kind of a Kylo Ren sort of mm-hmm, way. Right. Mm-hmm. And right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, yeah, it's true. Right. And, and so we talked about that and just how, you know, how yes. Simba. Simba. Yeah. And these yeah. are, this was a sixth grader who has not spent a lot of time with Shakespeare or Shakespeare's language mm-hmm. and just went, Oh, I get it. Yeah. And I connect yeah, by yeah. watching how he looks and feels. Yeah. Yep. All right. What do you have it for? Uh, number four, I have a show that was new to me this year and that I loved, uh, Coriolanus. Mm, I uh, saw it at the Shakespeare Festival, have a review up on UTBA, so check it out. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was uh, it was really powerful because uh, it's politically neutral, right? It would be really easy for a lot of people to say, oh, you know, and, and I, I think that a lot of people make the arts very politically charged. And, and I think that sometimes there's good reason for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but this was a play where he is consistently put in a position where he doesn't get a whole lot of support in doing what he thinks is right. Um, and it asks some very challenging questions without a lot of satisfying answers. So I Mm -hmm. really liked, I liked the staging of it. Um, it felt like Shakespeare's Rambo, which was fun to watch. (laughs) Um, and it was, I, I don't know, the, the, the senator and the consul or like who's who's kind of backing him up as he's trying to be consul is a fascinating character and it just you know there's there's a mother-son dynamic that's really intense and complicated maybe one of the more intriguing ones anywhere in Shakespeare I think even more so than Hamlet and yeah it was it was interesting Mm -hmm. yeah I I feel like there was a movie version of that just a couple of years ago I think so yeah 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 uh so I for my next one I actually have a fellow. Okay. For I did see it one time at the Shakespeare Festival years and years ago and was really struck by it. And I've always kind of been fascinated by stories of of jealousy and envy and and uh, I think that that is of the deadly sins. I think it's one of the most uh, easy. It's the one that's sort of most easily to 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 be susceptible to. Yeah. You know. And yeah. um. And the way that Othello uh, becomes just more and more envious and jealous and of Iago and, and how Iago manipulates Othello. And uh, when it really does, Des- Desmodona was loyal to him all along, yeah. but uh, he allowed that little thought to, to take plant in his head and it just grew and grew and grew. Um, so it's one I wish that more people... I got, I wish I had more chance to see it because you don't see it very often. Well, and again, the envy ultimately starts with Iago, right? Iago only manipulates him because he's envious of everything about his life. Mm -hmm. And he uses that same envy to destroy him from the inside. And yeah. 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 So what do you have at three? Um, I have Henry five. Okay. Uh, Mm -hmm. I love the the Kenneth Branagh version. I love mm-hmm. the St. Christmas Day speech. Yeah. And there's a really good youth version of it that I saw at BYU. Um, and it just, it's just one of those stories that um, I, I think it's probably the most relatable of the histories. I think it's the most accessible. Um, and you get to come back and look at Henry trying to figure out how his people feel right um mm-hmm. he he's going to war it doesn't feel winnable it feels hopeless and he goes i need to figure out how my men feel about this he goes in private to all of them listens to their conversations participates in them and then has to come back and say my men are my men are in despair and if you're in despair you're going to lose you know you can't you can't win a battle you don't believe you can win and how you how you rally that and come back and say even if we lose we need to we need to move forward optimistically and i think that that's just such a powerful that that whole sequence is so powerful and you know 
<laughs> I wish I was there at St. Crispin's Day, you know, where you come back mm-hmm. and go, yeah, okay, I, I want to be there. I want to do the thing. Yeah. That is a good one. Yeah. I've only seen it though. I've only seen the movie. I've never gotten to see it on stage, but I'd like to. Um, my number three is a um, Much Ado About Nothing. Oh, that's a good one. And I think the Much Ado About Nothing is practically perfect. There's really almost nothing I would change. And as a rom com fan, uh, you know, the covers of oh, Marky's podcast, uh, it's definitely, <laughs> I, 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 I definitely drawn to it. Uh, the, the, is the like ultimate enemies to lovers with Beatrice mm-hmm. and Benedict. I mean, you can get more and, uh, and then you have hero and, <clears throat> and, uh, um, and Claudio and, and the, so you've got all these, these different relationships going on at the same time. And, uh, I do love the Kenneth Branagh, Emma Thompson film. I think it's, you know, it's adorable. Keanu, yeah. Keanu Reeves yeah. aside. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> I love Keanu Reeves. <laughs> it's outstanding. <laughs> he, he maybe wasn't meant for Shakespeare, but, uh, but I, I really, you got Michael Keaton in there. It's just a, it's yeah. just a, a, a fun, a, a fun film. And, yeah. uh, and so yeah, it's a favorite. Oh, yeah. And Denzel Washington is mm-hmm. phenomenal in that, you yeah. know, that whole sequence where they're they're spoiling things or like leaking the secret, so to speak, to Benedict. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. He's, he's so great. <laughs> <laughs> he's perfect for that role because yeah. you can tell how much joy he takes in doing mm-hmm. that. It's it's so good. Yeah. So what do you have at two? At two, I have Romeo and Juliet. Oh, okay. I've seen it three mm-hmm. times this year. Um, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I See, that's why you like, were the perfect person to act because oh, we all saw it. So it, they, he could have picked Russ could have picked anybody, yeah, to to review it because we were all there. Yeah. Um, but you were the perfect person to review it because you know. I, well, I love it because again, I love, uh, I like, I like complicated romance, right? Mm-hmm. And it doesn't work. Um, it's it's the same reason Hades Hades Town strikes such a good chord with me is that sometimes you have this beautiful romance that on paper, everything makes sense. And there are just factors beyond your control that stop it. Mm-hmm. And y- it doesn't matter, right? And mm-hmm. I love, like, I have a wonderful marriage. I have a wonderful life and, and like very good support. And I, I wouldn't want that in my personal life, but there's something very cathartic about looking at that and going, wow, imagine having to be in a place where you that is what you're up against you know Mm -hmm. um and the version i saw at shakespeare festival was phenomenal the uh actors from the london stage version that i saw this year was phenomenal and the parker version was good but had a hard time living up to both of those yeah that makes Uh, sense i kind of liked that they tried to i felt like they were trying to maybe to a fault they were trying to make it sort of more you audience friendly putting in some like action, some sword fights, yeah. some like, you know, stuff like that and trying to kind of move things around and make it just a little bit more accessible. I thought but that the nurse they may Tibble have gone too far with that, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the nurse Tibble relationship worked well with that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and that's one of the things that I love about Parker. Like I, I would rather have them err on the side of making that mistake because so many of their other shows um, I've heard Edwin Drood was great, but I loved their pumpkin giant last year. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I loved Hamlet. I loved their frog and toad and they, they do such a good job of authentically and naturally doing things to engage the audience. I just think that the way that it happened with this one didn't Mm -hmm. land the right notes with me. It doesn't mean it didn't work for other people, you know? Yeah, I can see that. Well, my number two, I have Macbeth and I, I just think it's so well-crafted. It may also be a a perfect play. I mean, it's so engaging. It draws you in. It's got such compelling characters. I, and I had such a cool experience. I mean, I've seen it a number of times, but I, uh, I went to Twilly, um, uh, Twilly theater company. I think that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they have like literally in the mountain, they've got, you like sit on rocks. (laughs) It's this outdoor (laughs) outdoor amphitheater and they did Macbeth and it was outstanding. (laughs) I love Shakespeare outside. It was so cool. And uh, I don't know, I just, I think it's so satisfying by the time you get to out, out damn spot 
and yeah. uh, and the madness and everything it just builds you're so invested uh and uh so yeah it's 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 really good there's a really great um bbc shakespeare retold of macbeth mm. that takes place in a kitchen like a, a michelin star kitchen oh, interesting. and it's fantastic that and the um the hollow crown series are both really really good versions mm. of uh, like filmed versions of the shakespeare stories so yeah interesting uh so what do you have as your number one your favorite um a lot of the ones you mentioned are so good right i love yeah. macbeth i love i i did an othello scene where i was iago in junior high and have like that character that that friend and i who he played I- othello or he played iago and i played othello um uh-huh. was you know and this was in spanish fork so you know we're right like in southern utah county so me playing othello maybe not uh professionally but in the middle school being able to do that scene was so impactful. Um, and I love all of all of the ones you mentioned, but my number one is King Lear. Mm-hmm. Um, I uh, I had I read the James Shapiro book, The Year of Lear mm-hmm. um, a couple of years ago. And it was such an insightful thing about how in Jacobian England, you have, you know, people who want to break up, you know, the united kingdom and and james is pushing for unification of the different countries under one crown and shakespeare writes king lear kind of pointing to hey we know we need unification we need these things um and it's around the same time as the gunpowder treason plot but the story itself is so good and i saw it uh the most recent time i saw it was at um again at shakespeare festival which I promise I've seen Shakespeare other places. I just have seen a lot of it recently <laughs> yeah. the last three years or so at the festival. And it's been so good. Right. Um, I mean, it's Tony award winning. It's, it's right. It's right. amazing. It's not like I'm apologizing for seeing it at <laughs> the junior high that I went to, which was yeah. also fun. But, uh, but I, uh, in the opening scene, there's a, an actor named Aidan O'Reilly who has been at the Shakespeare festival a couple of times. And he was at American Shakespeare theater this year um, or American, Uh, the one in Virginia, I think, and has played several parts, but he was the fool. And it was this fascinating sequence where I'd seen him as Richard the year before uh, in Richard the third. And as the fool, he's watching the whole, like drawing the map and, you know, the older daughters are flattering him and he's being silly and goofy. And the fool doesn't have a line in this entire scene, but his body language indicated what was happening for the entire court, where when things are jovial, he's leaning over the balcony in the second level of, of the, Ingolstadt theater and he's laughing and he's pointing at things and you know making fun of the different daughters and things but then when things get really serious with Cordelia you have him kind of backing up and then as you see Lear like leaning into this terrible decision to just shred his one loyal daughter you know he's backed up against the wall and that set such a great tone and that was actually uh it rained during the blow wind speech like rained hard during that oh wow um, and we got rained out of all's well that ends well either the night before or the night after. So being able to see that in the rainstorm and just having this really impactful thing. Again, it it tells such an important story of people allowing the worst in them to destroy them. And there's that sequence at the very end where Cordelia looks at Lear, you know, and he says, is this my daughter? And she says, it is. And he goes, you know, um, you you should hate me and and you have all this cause to hate me and she says no cause no cause mm. uh even though he was so terrible to her this this moment of forgiveness and again they they both die and ends tragically and and but there's this one really sweet moment right before they do where she could have chosen to be bitter and angry like her sisters and wasn't and i I love that redemptive part of the story. You know, I feel like so many of the other tragedies, you know, you see at the end of Hamlet or at the end of Macbeth, you see the revenge or you see the, you know, the good night, sweet prince and and they're sad and and you just look at it and go, this is what bad decisions lead to. But I feel like Lear is one of the few stories, that and Winter's Tale, which I, I almost put in my top five, um, as stories where, yeah, people make really bad decisions and you still get the opportunity for, even momentary just a little bit of redemption that that says you know this wasn't okay you made the wrong choice but i don't have to live forever in this Mm -hmm. this tragic hell 
So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's, I've seen it one time before. I would love to see it more. I really would. Um, well, my number one is, it seems like a lark compared to your number one, but my <laughs> number one is a uh, 12th night is my uh, favorite. Yeah. I just think it is so genuinely funny. And, uh, and, you know, like I said, I'm a rom-com girl Absolutely. and I like the way that it kind of plays with gender and, uh, uh-huh. and you have, you know, Olivia falling in love with Viola, who she, she thinks is a man and, uh, and, and then it getting kind of complicated and, and what do they think? And, and of course that time that was all just played for complete laughs, but now in a, it's sort of a different, our different understanding of gender. I think it, it's sort of interesting and, but still funny. And, uh, yeah. and then, uh, you know, you just have like Malvolio, uh, with the, with the yellow stockings, the, stock, the, the stockings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's so funny. And I mean, I even like, uh, she's the man. The, oh yeah. <laughs> with, with the, with the really tampon in the nose and everything. Yes. 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 <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I, it's just my favorite. It's the one that I would, I, I would go anywhere to see it if I heard anyone was putting it on. Cause I really enjoy it. Well, and it has some of the like some of the most quotable parts of Shakespeare, like the, if music be the fruit of love play mm-hmm. on, you know, mm-hmm. I have the, have you ever played bards dispense profanity? Mm-mm. So it's a card game in the vein of cards against humanity, mm-hmm. but it's entirely Shakespeare quotes. Oh, and fun. oh man, I, <laughs> I have never played it with a group of people that didn't love it. So I played mm-hmm. it with a lot of friends, but I also took it. Uh, I taught English to uh, like, non-traditional high school students for a year so like adult mm-hmm. learners things like that yeah. and I had a bunch of people who didn't graduate high school who had never seen a play before who were struggling to read Shakespeare at all and who still could take Shakespeare's you know mm-hmm. silliest and in some case dirtiest quips and make some really great jokes <laughs> out of them <laughs> that's fun that's sounds fun it's a great game we need to yeah. do it sometime we need that's to get fun. together yeah that would be fun play cards <laughs> dispense profanity yeah. <laughs> Sure. So I asked my Twitter, what is your favorite Shakespeare play? So um, Becky Sears Chick, she says, it's extremely hard to pick if I have to pick one Twelfth Night. Rachel McMillan, yep. Much to Do About Nothing. Lopria says Twelfth Night or for drama Hamlet. Tammy says Midsummer's Night Dream and King Lear. Wesley Eversall says Hamlet. Cool. Uh, Bex says The Merchant of Venice. Uh, Lauren Masters says Midsummer's Night Dream. Ryan Sanders says Midsummer's Night Dream for Tragedy, Hamlet, and Nick Love's 80s horror, Macbeth. So we got a little of everything there. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. And I feel like a lot of crossover with our own list. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. And I will say in in defense of Midsummer, Midsummer is a great story and it's funny and there are iconic moments. Sure, I just sure. think that I've seen it enough. Yeah. yeah. You know, I feel I, that way about Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. fair. Well, let us know what your picks would be. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comment section or on Twitter. Uh, please put your thoughts there. And if people want to follow you on social media or your your reviews at HBA, yeah, how do they do that? Um, so I I'm on Twitter for my podcast about theater for young audiences as podcast mm-hmm. tya. Um, and then yeah, uh, just and I'll put a link to that like... in the in the description so people can check out that podcast too. Yeah, and I have a, a couple more episodes that should launch this uh, this month. I have a conversation that I had with Tim Webb of the Oily Cart Company about doing theater with and for uh, children and young people who have uh, special needs or profound multiple learning disabilities mm-hmm. and, and phenomenal stuff. Um, I talked to him for one episode about uh, how I have, how I last year had a class in my middle school about theater with special needs students because our our middle school is a magnet for that in our district and then he talks quite extensively about his phenomenal book and about you know the work of oily cart company and how you make theater that you know reaches uh, a very very marginalized community Mm -hmm. yeah that sounds great uh well you can find all the episodes of theater tuesday in the playlist that i'll put in the description so make sure to check that out 
And also you can find my writing at UTBA and also at rachelsreviewstheater.com. I'll put a link to that as well in the description. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. So check that out. Mm. Also, uh, if you are listening <laughs> to the episode on iTunes, please leave your ratings and reviews. That really, really helps a lot. And if you, and share, please tell your friends. And if you are listening on YouTube, please give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. Appreciate that so much. I also have the patron group and merch store. So check that out. And uh, thanks so much. This was so much fun to get to know you better and to talk about theater. Same. Uh, this is so good. I, I would love to do this again sometime. Yes, definitely. And we'll talk to you all later. Bye.